Hello and welcome to another online service here at New Mercies Community Church. First off, I'd like to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Certainly mothers are an important part of our culture and our society. Uh, every family uh, has a mother and uh, they play such an important role in raising children, establishing values. And it's always good to stop and to honor those that, that do so much. Sometimes we take things for granted. Uh, people are there, they always do what they need to do, but we need to stop and thank them, especially once in a while. This morning's message is not geared specifically towards mothers, but I think it's helpful for families uh, as we understand that God is working in our lives and he has a plan that's the best plan for our lives. Uh, we're hopeful that as the economy starts to open up and different areas of the economy are opening up that uh, maybe even by next week and we will get information out about that uh, specifically uh, maybe at the end of this video uh, but we, we're hopeful that that's the, the, the way it's going to be. We're going through a difficult time of stress and stress makes everything worse. I googled and uh, uh, WebMD I asked what does stress complicate? And really, stress complicates everything. I didn't realize obesity, Alzheimer's, along with diabetes, uh, heart disease, and other things that maybe we associate with stress. But so many areas are being affected uh, by being quarantined, separated, uh, stress from economic and all the other things that cause stress. And also heard recently that loneliness is a big problem. We understand that a lot of people are isolated, uh, but people that work at home are used to being in a work environment where they interact with people. And working at home can create loneliness, which is another problem that also adds to stress. I knew someone that uh, didn't work, raised their children, uh, her husband was a landscaper, had his own business, and after all her children were raised, uh, she went to work for him. And then he retired, uh, but she stayed working, and the reason she did was because she enjoyed the working with the other women in the office. And so we can see that loneliness uh, can be a, a, a result of, of just working from home and being by yourself. So there's a lot of things that uh, working can do. Working can not only make a living, but it also provides an association with other people and helps us in those ways as well. We are aware, I'm sure, that we need, we are social people and we need to be around others. I remember growing up watching uh, on the wonderful world of Disney that came on every Sunday night. Uh, there was a special on bears and uh, the story followed a mother and she had two little cubs that she had. And after the second year, she chased the cubs away uh, because that's what bears do. And I remember being sad because I'm thinking, oh, I hope my parents don't chase me away, you know, when I get to a certain age in life. Uh, bears maybe need to be isolated, but as people, we need to be a part of a family. My family was important to me, and I'm sure if you grew up in a good family that that was a good foundation for your life, and you enjoyed that time that you had together. I have a niece that's a psychiatrist, uh, lives down in Tennessee and works in Knoxville, and called her the other day about something, and I asked her, I said, what are you seeing uh, as a result of what's going on in our culture today? And she said that in the area of mental health, that every area of mental health is facing almost a crisis. She said that suicides one week during this period equals three months. That's 12 times the suicide rate because of the stress that we're going through and the complications uh, because of that. The uh, crisis hotlines are up 33 points. 338% uh, because of what we're going through. So there's a lot of difficulty, a lot of stress. Saw so also that uh, people that attend church regularly, those that attend church every week, are five times less likely to commit suicide. So that tells me that God's word and coming together as God's people is the antidote 
for the problems that we face in our culture. And so we must realize and recognize that God has the answer. And that's what we'll be looking at again today, is how God is working in our lives to help us, not only in the good times, which we have enjoyed for so long, but now as we go through the difficult times as well. So we need help. And one of the ways that we get help is to have people in our lives. But when we have people in our lives, it can do one of two things. It it can either help or it can hurt. Anytime I counsel people that are getting married, I always talk to them about the importance of maintaining the relationship that they have. Because when people fall in love, they're uh, enjoying being around each other and they put the best face on everything and they act uh, the way they should. But sometimes after people get married, they take each other for granted and things kind of fall apart and they don't do the little things to show and express the love that they have for each other. Maybe that love is there, but if you don't express it, it doesn't really help in that relationship. And I always tell people that are getting married, I say there's nothing better than a good marriage when you have someone to support you and to care about you, but there's nothing worse than a bad marriage. Because in a marriage, you are in contact with those people every day, and you don't just get away from them and get away from the problems, but you need to deal with those problems. And that's the way it is with all relationships. We need to work at those relationships because a good relationship helps us, but bad relationships tear us down and can be quite a serious problem. Last week we talked about forgiveness and the importance of of not holding grudges and letting go uh, so that relationships can heal and be stronger. Today I want to look at the scripture in just a little bit that we are to be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that's what we want to talk about just in a little bit. The book of James is a very practical book. I can remember a long time ago someone telling me, if you want to know about God's love, the first book you need to read is the Gospel of John, because it talks about how much God loves us. And then he said, after you know about God's love, the next book you need to read is the book of James. Because the book of James is the practical application of all the things that God is telling us to do. So how do we live? How does it work its way out in our everyday lives? And we'll be looking at that book in just a little bit. We're going through trouble. We're going through adversity. And that's really how the book of James starts out. Uh, When you read early in the book of James, it almost doesn't make sense because the first thing he said is, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when I look at the book of James, I'm not so sure that I'm happy that the first thing he says is, consider it pure joy when you go through all kind of trouble. I don't like trouble in my life. I like my life to go smoothly and everything to fall into place. But we realize that if we don't go through adversity, then we don't develop perseverance and we don't become mature in our lives. And so it's, it's necessary for us to go through uh, the difficult times in order to develop a mature attitude about life and also to learn to look to God as well. And so James is a lot of practical advice about life. It's not just theory, but it's how it really works in the everyday life. And I think that's what we all wanna know is not just what's a good idea, but what works? A lot of good ideas that people have, but they, they don't work. They're not practical in the real life. But the Word of God is that practical life for us. And so we develop that perseverance. We don't like trouble. We don't like discipline. But a lack of discipline leads to uh, an unruly life. And the Bible says that no discipline is pleasant at the time, but we need it as we go through it to help us in our lives. So the wisdom that we have that God gives us that comes from the Bible is to help us to go through the difficult times and to develop a maturity so that we are able to understand and go forward in our life. 
If life is too easy, then we become self-confident. If life is too easy, we, we don't realize the dangers and troubles in life and we become overconfident. So we can be self-confident or overconfident and think that everything will work out, but we need to be able to learn to, to trust in God because life is not going to be easy and we need God. We need God in our lives. I think we've gotten away as a culture and a society, gotten away from God, but we need to get back to the things that God has for us because we need some authority in our life, someone that we look up to, that we respect, that gives us guidance that we're willing to follow. When we're born, our parents are there and they take care of us, they change our diapers and they feed us. And as, as we grow and develop a little bit, you know, with our parents are there, we're, we're not old enough to understand and know what's going on, but as we get older, we understand that our parents are there and they're taking care of us and they're guiding us. And so we develop a trust with our parents because they've taken care of us and we know uh, what they're doing. And so we, we have a confidence that, that they're there for us because they've expressed that love. And then later, as I grew up in my life, I, I knew my parents loved me. I knew they cared for me. And so the response to their love was that I loved them back. And one of the goals in my life was to please my parents. They'd done so much for me and I wanted to please them. And so I didn't want to bring shame upon myself and I didn't certainly want to bring shame upon my parents. And so that's how my relationship with my parents developed. And that's also, I think, how our relationship with God develops. At first, maybe we don't understand and realize all that he's doing in our life but as we go through life and as we look back over, we can see that the things that the Bible has told us, the things that we learned in church, the things that we saw modeled by people that we respected, all came from God. And so we learned to trust him. Going back again to the scripture that says, we love him because he first loved us. He does so many things for us and our devotion to him is just a response to the love that he has for us. And he is just caring about us all the time. In uh, James, it also says, when you are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So that's reminding us that God doesn't tempt us. God doesn't lead us astray. He wants to protect us and to guide us. He's not going to lead us down the wrong path, tempt us. But you know, we all have desires. We were created with desires. We're hungry, so we eat. Um, we have desires to belong, and so we want to belong to different groups and be a part of a family and have friends and care about those things. But there's a good way to satisfy all the desires that God has created for us. And there's a bad way, the way of the world and the way of God. So we need to follow his way and trust and know that his way is the best way for us as we go through our life. In the short term, the easy way is Satan's way. In the hard way, in the short term. So in the easy way, maybe you say, well, I'll get out of this, I'll just tell a lie. And you get out of whatever it is, but sooner or later you develop a reputation as a liar. So the easy way for the short term is bad for the long term. And so we need to confess our sins. We need to stand up for what we've done and not lie to get out of things, but make things right. But in the end, if we do that, if we follow what God asks us to do, in the end we will be a better person and we will have a better reputation, a better character as people think about our lives and, and who we are. We have desires, and we have the freedom to make choices. Uh, I think one of the things that, that I'm learning uh, through this crisis that we're going through now is that uh, some of our freedoms are maybe taken away. People can't go to work. A lot of things that they want to do, they're not allowed to do. And maybe under these circumstances, 
uh, that's what's necessary. But I hope for the long term that we, we understand that freedom is an important thing. And that, as we understand God, is that he gives us that freedom. We have the right to make choices. We can make right choices or wrong choices. But each choice we make as a consequence, and in the end, we are held accountable for that. As I said, James uh, talks about the practical aspect of living. When I think of the book of James, two things come to my mind. First of all, is faith and works. James says faith without works is dead. You can't believe something without acting. And the other thing that he talks about is the, the danger of the tongue. Uh, that's characteristic, you know, uh, we read that in the book of James. Uh, when we're under a lot of stress, everything becomes more difficult. Normally in a situation, if we're not under stress, we take time and a decision comes along and we stop and we consider and what should we do and think about the consequences of the choices that we make. But when we're under stress, we feel I have to make a decision right away. And sometimes we don't make the right choices because we don't take time to stop and think about everything that's going on. That brings us to the scripture that I mentioned earlier from the book of James. <clears throat> In the 19th chapter, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because man's anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. We probably all heard that scripture over and over again. We've heard it, but do we understand it? And do we apply it in the different situations that we go through in our life? We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Our human nature is when something happens, the, the quick thing to do is to react without stopping and thinking. But when we need to listen, we need to be quick to listen and then take in what it is that we hear. What did they say? What did they mean by what they said? I can remember, I don't know whether it was in a math class or a physics class or something, but a long time ago, I heard somebody say, what you need to do first of all is gather all the information, everything you know about a problem that you're trying to solve, write it all down, then analyze that information, and then after you have analyzed that information, then apply the things that you know as to how to solve that problem. And then you can make an informed decision. And that's what we have to do in life. When we hear something, we have to say, what did they say? Did they mean what they say? Uh, you know, sometimes we can say things and people don't hear, you know, what we intend to say. So there's a miscommunication there. And so we, we have to work through those things. Um, is it consistent with the person you know? You know, some people that you know, you can trust them. They're not going to say anything to hurt you because you have a confidence with that person. And those are the, the best kind of friends to have, to know that they're not going to say anything to hurt you, but they're always looking out for, for your best interest. Uh, so if it's not consistent with who they are, then maybe you need to question them to get to what they are really saying. But then there's other people that are negative. There are people that are not nice. I have people that if they say something about me, I'm not surprised at all, you know, if it might be negative, it might be hurtful. But even in those situations where people are not being nice, we need to stop and consider, we need to think about the outcome of how we're going to react to what they said. Because maybe they had, you know, bad motives in saying something about us, but, does it help us to react in a negative way to, to what they say? You know, what is the consequence of how we act? So we need to be quick to hear, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. So before we speak, we, we need to stop and think, you know, what's, what's really going on? Uh, Proverbs has a lot to say about the tongue and a lot about wisdom. And Proverbs 15 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath 
but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of a fool gushes folly. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. How true that is. So not only is it what we say, but how we say it. When I was in high school, I mean, there's a few things that stick in my mind, you know, from back all those years ago. But uh, we used to have the PA announcements, you know, sometime during the end of the day. And some of the girls that worked in the office would read the announcements. And at the end of the announcements, there would be, would so-and-so come to the office? My name was not there. I don't know if they were going down to get a detention or if they were going down to the office, you know, for to get commended for something. I'm not sure what it was, but there was one girl that just had the sweetest voice and she would say the announcements and uh, even if she said, would so-and-so come to the office, even if you're going to get a detention, you know, the way she said it just sounded so nice. You know, we can say things in a pleasant voice and be positive, or we can be harsh with our words. So it's not only the words that we say, but the manner in which we say those words that affect those around us. So that's why it's always important to be careful in thinking about what we say and how we say it, because what we say and how we say it will affect other people. So we need to be slow to speak. We can't take words back. You know, we can say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But once it's said, it's in the brain of that other person and it's always kind of in the back of our mind. Did they mean it? Why did they say it? If they didn't mean it, why would they say it? Kind of the thing, reason I don't like answering machines and voicemail, because once it's there, it, you can't take it back. You know, it's there and it's there forever. Uh, so we need to be careful about what we say. You can't unspread butter. You can't unsay words. Those words are always there. So we need to be quick to listen, to get the information, but slow to speak because our words can help or our words can hurt. We all know this. I probably haven't said anything in this message so far that you didn't already know. But the question is, do we know it or do we, are we able to put it into practice? Because in the heat of the moment, sometimes the logic that we know goes out the window. And that's why we have to stop and think, engage our brain, as they say, before we put our mouth in gear. Slow to, slow to become angry. Little good comes out of anger. When we speak based on anger, it's really, most often just the heat of the moment and our reaction is often sinful because we're reacting rather than acting. To react is just to respond to the situation. To act is to stop and to consider. Because it says there in James that man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires for each of us. So when we're angry, we're out of control. And man's anger does not bring about the righteous life. The righteous life is a life where we stop and say, what's the right thing to do here? What would God, what would my heavenly father want me to do in this situation? And then we will act that way. One of the reasons I don't drink alcohol is I've seen friends when I was in, uh, going to Carnegie Tech, I had two friends good friends that almost tried to kill each other. They were both drunk. They were both acting, you know, irrationally. And I, I thought to myself, I remember, you know, that moment thinking at that time that I have enough trouble doing the right thing when I'm sober, you know, and if I'm not in control of my feelings and my thoughts, I might do something that I would regret. If one of those people killed the other person, they would have to live with that the rest of their life. How many people in a moment of anger have said things or done things that they have to live with the rest of their life? 
It's the same thing with, with sexuality in that. How many people in the heat of passion, you know, have given birth or caused conception of a child that for the rest of that life, they have a responsibility for and probably would not provide a safe and secure home, a loving relationship for that child. So we need to consider before we act, how, what are the consequences of what we're going through? When we're angry, we're not in control. And so we need, the Bible says, to get rid of all the, uh, the anger and live and trust and do the things that God is calling us to do. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but that season goes over, but doing the right thing is always the, the correct thing to do, and we are to humbly accept the word that's planted in us. So we don't just listen, but we do the right things. James reminds us that we're not to be just hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. I think sometimes we confuse knowing the truth from doing the truth. I know what the right thing to do is in almost every situation. If you stop and think about it, you know what the right, situ right thing to do is. But the question is, do you do it? And that's why the Bible says we need to be not just hearers, but doers of the word. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It talks about a lot of things uh, that are very practical in how we live. And that sermon ends with the story about the wise man and the foolish man. And Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man that built his house upon a rock. The rains came down, the winds blew and beat against that house, the streams rose, but it didn't fall because it was built on a rock. Then he goes on to say, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and doesn't put them into practice is like the foolish man that built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The only difference was one did and one didn't. They both heard, but one reacted and followed, and the other one didn't. And so that's what it is, the difference between faith and works. You can believe something, but if you really believe it, your actions will follow. You can have works without faith. There are people that do good things in this world because they understand the goodness of doing good things. But you can't have faith. You can't know there's a God, know that that God loves you, know that God wants to help you, and not have the works that follow. So we need to make those choices. Words have power. Proverb 18 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. So as we think about going through the hard times that we're going through now, we're all a little stressed, and so we need to be extra careful, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So hope as you're going through your life now that you are trusting God, that you've realized that Jesus didn't come just to, to save us from our sins to, so we could go to heaven, but he came to give us a full and abundant life. And if we would just follow his words, how much better our families would be, how much better our friendships would be, how much better our communities and our nation would be, and we'll look at that a little bit more next week about the wisdom that comes from God and the wisdom of this world. So I hope you'll be listening. Maybe we'll uh, be able to do a live broadcast and follow up, but uh, regardless of how it goes, uh, God's word will have a message for us again next week. And I pray that you're trusting in him, that you've realized his goodness, and that you can count on him to be with you through all the storms and adversities of life. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. Thank you that you sent Jesus not only to take away our sins, but to teach us the goodness and the abundance of the life that you desire for us here and now. Bless us, we pray, and may we always live our lives in such a way that you get the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.